Hello. Well, here we are. I welcome you to this time of worship as we come together while being apart. I am the Reverend Jim Weber Cook, and I am here at Scottsburn United Church. And our service today will include a duet sung by Carol and Evan Bailey, musical offerings by our organist, Stuart Monroe, a special story for a time for the child and us all, and also another story written by Jan Phillips, which I'll share as my reflection. Carol Bailey will also be reading scripture, and Christine McKenzie is behind the camera recording this service. I am grateful to each of them for their gifts and being able to extend this ministry to you in a virtual way, while the public health directives prevent us from gathering face to face during this pandemic. So as we begin our worship as we do in our gathered services before this time, we light a candle, acknowledging that the light of Christ is within us when we are together and when we are apart. The light of Christ shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. This is the good news of our faith and the source of our hope. So I invite you now, as we move into this time of worship, to take a look around at our surroundings. This church sanctuary is not God. Our God is within and beyond. This planet is not God. Our God is within and beyond. This stone is not God. God is within and beyond. This Bible is not God. Our God is within and beyond. This cross is not God. Our God is within and beyond. We are not God. Our God is within and beyond. Our God is elusive and yet present. Our God is love's mystery revealed in Jesus the Christ. Our God is spirit made known within us. Our God, sacred presence, permeates all creation. So, how do we wrap our minds around all of that? Well, perhaps we don't completely. In our humanness, we experience sacred presence, and we sense that we are part of something bigger and greater than ourselves. And it is with this sense that we come to worship. I invite you into a time of prayer. Let us pray. God of all creation, out of your being all things were made. Yet in all things your being is uncontained. As we pause together now to share this time of spiritual reflection, may it be that we are open to that spirit of love that encompasses us and all. May glimmers of the deep truth come to us through scripture and story, through music and science. Help us to see you within all things, within all people. And help us to know that you are beyond our understanding, beyond our imagining, from everlasting to everlasting. And yet, you are with us now. Amen. 
As we explore understandings of the sacred today, of which we often use the word God, I want to invite you to listen to words of Jesus from John's Gospel, which Carol will read. Words in which Jesus speaks of God as presence, using the word advocate, another name for Holy Spirit or Holy Mystery. I'm reading John chapter 14, verses 15 to 19. If you love me, you will show it by doing what I have taught you. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while, the world will not no longer see me. But you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. Thank you, Carol. A time for the child and us all today will be the sharing of a, a story which is a favorite of mine. It's written by Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. And it's beautifully illustrated by Phoebe Stone. It's entitled, In God's Name. And I'm sharing it today with the permission of Turner Publishing. After God created the world, all living things on earth were given a name. The plants and the trees, the animals and the fish, and each person, young and old, had a special name. But no one knew the name for God. So each person searched for God's name. The farmer, whose skin was dark like the rich brown earth from which all things grew, called God Source of Life. The girl, whose skin was as golden as the sun that turned night into day, called God Creator of Light. The man who tended sheep in the valley called God Shepherd. The tired soldier who fought too many wars called God Maker of Peace. The artist who carved figures from the earth's hard stone called God my rock. Sometimes the people who called God by different names were puzzled. They said, every living thing has a single name. The marigold, pansy, and lily, the oak tree, sequoia, and pine. God must have a single name that is greater and more wonderful than all the other names. Each person thought his name for God was the greatest. Each person thought her name for God was the very best. The farmer, who called God source of life, said, This is the true name for God. The girl who called God creator of light insisted, this is the most splendid name for God. The shepherd, soldier, and artist believe that they each had the perfect name for God. No one, though, listened, least of all God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. The woman who cared for the sick called God healer. The slave, who was free from bondage, called God Redeemer. The grandfather, whose hair was white with the years, called God Ancient One. The grandmother, who was bent with age and sorrow, called God Comforter. The young woman who nursed her newborn son called God Mother. The young man who held the hand of his baby daughter called God Father. 
and the child who was lonely called God friend. All the people called God by different names. They tried to tell one another that their name was the best, the only name for God, and that all other names were wrong. But no one listened, least of all God. And so each person kept searching for God's name. Then, one day, the person who called God Ancient One, and the one who called God Friend, the one who called God Mother, and the one who called God Father, all the people who called God by a different name came together. They knelt by a lake that was clear and quiet, like a mirror, God's mirror. Then each person who had a name for God looked at the others who had a different name. They looked into God's mirror and saw their own faces and the faces of all the others. And they called out their names for God, source of life, creator of light, shepherd, mother, maker of peace, my rock, healer, redeemer, ancient one, comforter, mother, father, friend, all at the same time. At that moment, the people knew that all the names for God were good, and no name was better than another. And then, all at once, their voices came together, and they called God One. Everyone listened, most of all, God. Music is a significant part of our connection to the sacred. And I welcome Evan and Carol to offer the gift of special music, the song God of the Mountain.
Thank you so much, Carol and Evan, for that beautiful gift. I invite you now to listen to words of scripture from the Acts of the Apostles. I'm reading from chapter 17, verses 22 to 31. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown. This I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is God served by human hands, as though God needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath to all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and grope for God, and perhaps find him, though indeed God is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now God commands all people everywhere to repent, because God has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness by one whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by the raising of this one from the dead. May we gain understanding and a deepened faith from these words of Scripture. Amen. As we've just heard, Paul is in the city of Athens in Greece, and he gives a, a powerful speech in which he acknowledges that he has witnessed that they are religious people because he has seen all kinds of idols and altars of worship throughout the city, including, as you heard, one which was inscribed to an unknown God. Paul turns this around to declare that God is not unknown to him, but is the power that made this world and everything in it, the power that made all the people of the world from one ancestor. And in what would be a stirring sermon, he acknowledges that it is our human path to wonder to seek meaning, and to search for God. And for many of us, I think this is yet true. We are on a spiritual quest, seeking for God. We are full of questions and wonderings, insights and experiences. And in this text, Paul shares something of his understanding of the sacred with this often used and quoted line, in God we live and move and have our being. Take a moment to think on those words. In God we live and move and have our being. Paul is trying to put into words a sense that he has that God is not only to be located in certain objects or places, and in fact, he turns it around to say that we, and all things exist in God. God is not up there. God is not out there. All that is, including us, are within God, according to Paul's understanding. I want to share with you today a contemporary story that invites us to continue considering the nature and the whereabouts of God. It's a story that was written by Jan Phillips in 2015. Jan was one of the theme presenters on two different years at the annual Atlantic Seminar on Theological Education, which has been held for the past 51 years 
in the Bible Hill Truro area of Nova Scotia. Jan Phillips, just to introduce you briefly, is an author, a speaker, an artist, an activist, and she's known as a visionary thought leader. She is the founder and executive director of the Living Kindness Foundation. And I have been in touch with Jan and I have her permission to share this story, which is entitled, When God Gave Up on Humans. It came to pass in the 21st century that God gave up on the human race. He scrawled his message across the sky in words that were understood by every tribe and nation. You are on your own. In 20 centuries, you have failed to love each other. You use me as a reason to hate and to kill. You endanger your children. You poison the earth. I am done with you. You'll have to find me in each other from now on. Well, the people on earth wept and worried. What will become of us, they wondered. Who will we run to? Who will provide for us? How will I find my car keys? They asked, throwing up their arms in despair. Over the years, even the adults had become like children in their notions of God. While every holy book encouraged them to find God in themselves and in each other, they insisted in keeping God up in the heavens. They made God responsible for everything, saying, God did this or God did that. As long as God was Heavenly Father, they could act as children, and they often did. Even when great teachers came to tell them they were one with God, they were the hands and the arms and the legs of God. They were the breath of God. They would not grow up. For growing up would mean that they would have to change their ways. And they did not want to. When the sky bulletin came, people flocked to the churches and the temples to see what to do. But no one there had an answer. For they too had kept God high on a cloud referring to God as up there or out there. It was God who made the miracles they preached, God who made the rules, God who punished, God who gave men all the power. They too were like children, and they were lost without God. Years passed, seasons changed, and life on earth changed dramatically when God left the people on earth. There was a great sadness, except for a few, a few who claimed they had felt all along that God was within them. Those people had no sadness, and in fact, quite the opposite occurred. They were secretly relieved that the people stopped calling out God's names for their reasons to hate or hurt others. Once God disappeared, People stopped fighting over what God meant in the Bible or the Quran. There was no point in fighting over God if God wasn't even around. If there was no God, there was nobody condemning anyone's behavior. No more infidels, no reason to take an eye for an eye. People stopped seeking out priests and caliphs, rabbis and ministers, for there was no God for them to mediate. They sought out instead the people who were joyful and calm in this time of abandonment, thinking they must know something special, something secret, to be so happy. One such person was a woman who sat under a tree in a village. How can you be so happy when God has left us? A villager asked her. Only that God who was far away has left, she answered. The spark inside still remains. It is our breath. That, to me, is God. It is the love within. If I am breathing, I am being breathed by God. For that I am joyful, for I am not alone. A soldier came to this woman. He put down his gun and he sat down beside her. 
I have been a patriot. I have gone to war for God and my country. I do not understand why God has left me. I do not know what to do. The woman smiled and took his hand. Those ideas in your head, you have learned from someone else, she said. Have you learned to listen to the voice within you? I do not know what the voice inside me has to say, he said. Then you must sit with someone and tell your story, for only then will you hear it. And when you are done with your story, listen to the story of the one who has heard you. Be real when you speak, and be ready when you listen, for it is in that conversation that you will find the answer to your next move. The wise woman under the tree counseled people through the day, as did all the wise women in towns and villages all around the world. They addressed the people's fears of living without God, and they reminded everyone that God lived right inside them. Over and over they held the hands of fearful people, saying, An old myth is dying, but a new one is being born. They help people grow up with a view of the Holy One deep within. They passed on secrets about finding the sacred in the sap of a maple, the flow of a river, the majesty of a mountain, and the people, in time, grew reverent toward the earth. They stopped asking questions like, what is your religion? Or, have you been saved? For everyone knew the other was holy, and the spark of that flame they once had called God. People learned to share their stories, to listen to their hearts, and to help each other. They changed their ways, they replenished the soil, they cleaned the waters, they harnessed the powers of wind and sun. And over time, the people grew up and saw the light. War stopped as Allah, God, was welcomed home in the hearts of the people. Once they found God in themselves and in each other, the people rejoiced and they were glad. They were free at last, bowing in joy to the earth and all the creatures.
What a wonderful world indeed. A world imbued with the sacred. Thank you, Louis Armstrong. Thank you, Stuart, for the gift of music. Let us take these moments to pray. Sacred presence pervading all, named in the scriptures as maker of heaven and earth and source of life. We are in different places for sharing this worship, and yet we are all in the same place of being within your presence. Struggle as we have to understand the great mysteries of the universe, we have yet felt a loving presence surrounding us and upholding us. In our tradition of faith, we have named that presence the Holy Spirit, the Advocate, a gentle, constant reminder of your presence walking beside us through celebration and through grief. We've come to a place of recognizing that you are the mystery in whom we live and move and have our very being. And we hold the great paradox of truth that you live beyond us and yet you live beside us and within us. You are known to us and yet you are a mystery beyond us. You are invisible with spirit and yet we have seen you. And we hold all of this in balance, seeking to never limit you, being ever at home with you, God, whose names are many, yet whose being is one in love. We give thanks for the refreshment of spring rains and for the warmth of the sun, for the greening of creation and the incredible wonders which surround us in this spring season. As lobster fishing is beginning, we are mindful of all who set out upon the waters on these shores with hopes that they will be safe as they fish their traps and provide food for our nourishment and enjoyment. As the pandemic continues to impact our lives, we are mindful of healthcare workers and other frontline workers whose days contain greater challenge than usual and whose efforts to provide care and essential services help us to live. In this week that's designated as National Nurses Week, we are particularly grateful for all the nurses whose vocation holds greater personal risk in these days and who seek to provide medical care and expertise with compassion. Holy One, we commit ourselves to be people who show forth your abiding love to those who have felt abandoned in this world. And so it is we pray for those who are grieving and seeking a new way forward, including all the families of those who have died as a result of COVID-19. We pray for those who are experiencing hunger or worry about where the next meal will come from or how they can pay the rent or the mortgage and whether or not they will have housing. We pray for those with health concerns, physical, emotional, or mental, that diminish their lives and cause suffering and pain. We pray for those who are finding that our current required state of isolation is wearing on them and is giving rise to depression, hopelessness, and loneliness. We pray for those who are living with violence, domestic abuse, or trauma as part of their daily lives. May your spirit be advocate and helper to all these we remember, and for all for whom these days seem to hold more shadow than light. Holy God, we know that the hurts of this world are not what you want for us. We know that you are with us, our comfort and our consolation, even in the hard times, up on the mountains, and down in the valleys. Help us to come alongside each other as well. Help us to be the tangible presence of your Spirit, the hands and feet of your love in this world, and enable us to embody your love as did Jesus with compassion, strength, and encouragement. Gathering these prayers from our hearts to the heart of this sacred universe, we say Amen. 
as we conclude this time of worship together, again, our appreciation for being able to share this time with you. Our life is in God, and God's Spirit is in us. May our hearts be turned to that way which is always bigger than we are, that which unites all creation in one origin and blessing, despite being known by many names. The great mystery of sacred presence is within us and remains with us always, source of comfort and calling, our home and our hope. In this faith may you find blessing, in Christ may you find peace, and in the Spirit may you find strength.